Hi everybody and welcome back to another edition of Beyond the Cage Live right here on MMA World. I'm your host Jim Graham. Thank you for joining me once again. On this week's show, I'm going to preview, predict the main card fights for UFC Singapore, which will be exclusively on UFC Fight Pass starting super early. <laughs> if you're on the east coast of the US, that's 8 a.m. Uh, with the main card, 5 in the west, and the prelims start at 4.30 uh, in the morning if you're over here on the east coast of the U.S. So that's a lot of fun, uh, 1.30 on the west coast. So I'm going to talk about that card again from Singapore. That will be uh, this Saturday, June 23rd. I'm also going to discuss a little bit about the Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series uh, of course, two episodes have happened so far on the Fight Pass series. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that, as well as EBI 16 returns. Again, that's going to be on Fight Pass as well. This Sunday evening, uh, EBI 16 will feature a tournament in the female bantamweight division and will also feature a combat jiu-jitsu uh, main event uh, with Richie the Boogeyman Martinez defending his combat jiu-jitsu title at EBI as a special event as well. And of course, I'm also going to talk a little bit about PFL2, better known as the Professional Fighters League, as they held their second event from Chicago just yesterday uh, with 13 fights. Uh, of course, and they also featured the debut of former uh, women's judo uh, champion from America, Kayla Harrison, as she took on Brittany Elkin in a female matchup at 155 pounds. So, going to talk about all that on this live edition of Beyond the Cage. Miles Painter is joining me in the comments section, helping me out and making sure I get to your questions. And again, anytime you want to get to some questions about mixed martial arts, feel free to comment below and I'll get to them as the show moves along. Once again, I'm your host, Jim Graham. You can follow me on Twitter at Jim Graham. And I want to kick off right with this UFC card. And that's what I want to kick off with here. UFC Singapore, again, that's going to be this Saturday. It, everything exclusively on UFC Fight Pass. Uh, eight fights technically on the undercard. Um, we got Alta Sazaki taking on Janil Lausa. That's going to be in the flyweight division. Uh, we're also going to have Matt Shell against Naoki Inoue, also in the flyweight division. Uh, Vivian Pereira, as she will take on Jan, boy, I'm going to probably say this last name wrong, Zaunan? I don't know. It's X-I-A-O-N-A-N. Probably said that wrong. Uh, Shinzo Anzai will take on Jake Matthews. That's going to be in the welterweight division. Also, Song Keenan against Hector Aldana in the welterweight division. Ronaldo Dai against Shane Young. That's at 145. Felipe Aranches against Song Yadong. Uh, that's going to be at bantamweight. And then rounding out the prelims for the Singapore card will be Mr. Ishihara, as he takes on Pitor Yan out of Russia in a bantamweight contest. Uh, looking over those eight undercard fights, I think actually a lot of matchups. Obviously a lot of names that people probably wouldn't recognize. Even some names I didn't even recognize. So definitely going to be a card for a lot of young and up-and-coming fighters. And obviously anytime they go to Asia, they typically have it with a lot of Asian fighters. So probably get to see a lot of people that... Maybe you haven't seen for a while. Um, and obviously Ishihara is a guy that's always very exciting. Um, taking on Pitor Yan, who I believe is a newcomer in the UFC. 8-1 uh, with his career record. Half of his wins coming by decision. Has a couple of knockouts, uh, but more of a decision guy. Like I said, 8-1 and one coming out of Russia. Making his debut against Ishihara, who's had some ups and downs in the UFC. Um... He debuted uh, in September of 2015. That was a draw against Mizuta Hirota. And then he went on to win two fights in a row, both by knockout. Uh, one of them uh, coming over Julian Rocha, as well as a win uh, over Horatio Gutierrez, which got him a performance of the night bonus. And then after that, he's kind of been on some tough times as he's lost three out of his last four fights. His lone win coming on another uh, against another guy fighting on the Singapore card in uh, Rolando Dai. 
that was by uh, decision. And of course, his other losses have been by decision, losing to uh, Joe, I believe that's Winoas, if I said that correctly, Gray Maynard, and Artem Lobov. Um, so obviously some, some big names in there. And he fought a lot of those fights at 145 pounds. So maybe, maybe that's what was wrong with him. Obviously, he's going to be dropping down to bantamweight for this fight. We'll see how that goes. I always thought he was a pretty solid um, fighter in the featherweight in terms of size. And obviously, we'll see how he does here at bantamweight. Obviously, we'll see how he makes the weight. We know he's been training with Team Alpha Male. Um, so we'll, obviously, they have a lot of good guys in the bantamweight division too. So... We'll see how he makes this adjustment, but definitely a, a guy that's always very exciting, a guy that's always down for a brawl. So I think that should be a lot of fun uh, to watch on Saturday night uh, around 4.30. Well, his fight won't be at 4.30, but <laughs> maybe around 7.30 or so when, when he kicks off. Um, I am always was a big fan of Matt Danger Schnell. I, even before his time on The Ultimate Fighter, I think he's a very good fighter, a very big flyweight taking on uh, an undefeated fighter in Naoki Inoue, who's 11-0 so far in his career coming out of Japan. Just the one UFC fight uh, where he took out Carlos John Thomas, uh, that was a decision win, but if I remember correctly, it was a relatively dominant victory um, for the uh, Japan native. So I think this is going to be a really good matchup uh, in the flyweight division. Both are very tall. Uh, if I did my math correctly, I want to say they're 5'8", I believe, which for, feth which for flyweight is pretty big. <laughs> I mean, I'm only 5'10", so just goes to show you these, these guys aren't that much shorter than me and weigh, or, you know, weighing in at 125 pounds. Um, just for sake of reference, in case anyone's knowing, I walk around at about 170 pounds. So just to show you, you know, th these are some pretty big flyweights. Uh, I wouldn't doubt if these guys probably, you know, get back up close to 150, maybe even on over 150 pounds uh, when they all rehydrate and eat and all that good stuff. So that's definitely one that I'm very much looking forward to uh, in the flyweight division. And also I want to highlight uh, Jake Matthews, obviously... We all know what happened with his last fight with the eye gouges and stuff uh, against the leech. So I'd like to see him kind of follow up that performance because even though, you know, if the eye gouge actually was a point taken away, he for sure wins that. With with the eye gouge, it, it made it a pretty close fight. Obviously, his fight before I, I didn't think was a, a, a particularly great uh, performance by him, though I, I think he did much better uh, against Leach. I'm referring to his win over Bohan uh, Vihalovic, which a fight where I didn't think he won. So that's what I'm saying. I thought he rebounded vicely. It definitely was deserving a fight at night uh, against Lee Jin Long. And so, how's he going to do this time? Uh, obviously, Shinzo Anzi is going to be a lot smaller than him. Uh, this is going to be one of the probably the few times he's actually going to be the bigger, the bigger guy uh, in the cage here. Um, so far, Anzi is 2-1 and one in the UFC. His two victories um, are kind of spread apart. He, had a, he actually debuted in the UFC in 2014, losing to Alberto Mina by knockout in the first round. He returned uh, September of 2015, uh, was able to win via TKO Dr. Stoppage against Rogers, Roger Zapata, and then hadn't fought... Uh, until September of last year, where he defeated Luke Jumo via unanimous decision. And now here, uh, June 2018, so this will be his fourth fight in the UFC uh, in four years. <laughs> so, you know, where's this guy at? H has he been injured? You know, was he actually cut? Um, you know, he's not that old. He's only 32 years old. So I would say, you know, he, he has a lot of life left and only has 12 professional fights overall. So I'm really interested to see how... You know, he deals with this, and I'm also, I think this is very curious matchmaking. I would think after beating a guy uh, in the leech, who I would consider pretty close to the top 15 in the welterweight division, you think Jake Matthews would get a little bigger name. Um, so I think this is a very curious matchup, in my opinion. But one I'm going to be looking forward to, because I've been a fan of Jake Matthews since his time on the tough smash. I think that he, he's doing very well so far in the move to welterweight. He was always a very big lightweight, and I think he is, I think these two fights now, he's starting to adjust, and I think he's really um, ready for a run here. Um, 
and the, this is a fight I don't typically pick the undercard, but I would say this is a this is should should be a fight Jake Matthews wins, um, maybe even gets a finish. So I, I think this is a even though I do think it's a curious booking, this is a fight I think the UFC gave him to kind of make sure uh, like is he legit at 170, and so this is a guy that he should be is better than should be bigger than. Uh, and, and that's kind of one of the big tests I think you have in mixed martial arts is when you get a guy you should beat. Um, and to me, it's not enough for Jake Matthews just to go in there and get a win. I think he needs to get a finish, in my opinion, to really make this a big deal. And then we'll probably see that jump up a competition in his next fight. All right, let's get to this main card here, which I think is actually a really good main, main card. Speaking of... Lee Jian Lang. The leech is actually going to be taking on Daiichi, uh, I believe it's, I believe they're calling him Abe, uh, out of Japan, China versus Japan here on the Singapore card. Obviously, the leech is coming off that fight against Jake Matthews, and while it was an incredible fight, it was a close fight, obviously, the eye poke is the things people are going to remember about, and the eye gouging there on that guillotine choke. So, for uh, Lee, I would give him, I'd give him the, he's definitely the favorite in this matchup. I think Abe is a very skilled individual. Obviously, you know, six and one. That's a very solid record. Uh, one and one so far in the UFC. He won his debut in September of last year against uh, Hin Gyum Lim, who is actually a very good fighter. I think a lot of people were surprised at that. Uh, but then lost a decision to Luke Jumo in his last fight in February of this year. So. I would say standing up, even though I think the leech has really developed into a very good boxer, has some good power, I would say that Abe's probably more comfortable staying on the feet. And if I was Lee, I would really try to get in close to him, use that use that nickname, use that leech, and really try to make this into a ground war. And I really think that's one of the reasons why Luke Jumo was able to come out on top. So I think if uh, Lee can kind of mix up the striking, get him off balance, and get the takedowns, then I, I think that um, the man from Japan is going to have a lot of trouble in this one. However, if it stays standing, I think it's a lot more even fight. I would say Lee probably has more power uh, than Abe, but I think Abe, even though the reach is going to be the same, they're pretty much the same height, uh, I think does use his range well. I think he's um, very comfortable even moving forward and striking off, off his back foot too. So I think just controlling the center for Lee isn't enough. This is a guy who will be okay striking on the outside and I think to really get him out of his comfort zone you got to get that clinch and get him up against the cage um, and I think that's going to be the battle there is that battle right there for Lee coming in either to clinch or double leg uh, and for Abe to really we'll see how well he can circle footwork um, because I think technically he's probably a little better striker all right the next fight of the evening boy I'm super excited for this one I'm a big fan of both these ladies in the female 125 pound division that's going to be jesse jess aka jessica rose clark taking on another jessica jessica evil eye again in the flyweight division this this is a huge fight i know um shevchenko is looking like she's going to take on nico montoya of course we just had sarge eubanks uh, successfully make her uh post tough uh debut beating lauren murphy and and doing so i think um definitely for sure by unanimous decision and you have these two ladies who I, I think with a win, they also factor in this picture as well. Currently ranked 9 and 10, uh, respectively, with Jessica Rose Clark uh, being 9 in this female flyweight division. Of course, um, I've interviewed Jessica many times over the years, even back when she was still in Bellator. And when she left Bellator to move up uh, to bantamweight to fight in the UFC, flyweight being her natural weight class, she was the number one ranked female fighter in the flyweight division. Uh, and Jessica I successfully made her uh, flyweight debut in her uh, last fight, which was her first UFC win since 2014. Um, she had lost four fights in a row, but she lost them to a who's who of fighters in the bantamweight division. Uh, all of them either being uh, like title challengers or ultimate fighter or, you know, champions themselves as she lost to Misha Tate, Juliana Pena, Sarah McMahon, and Batch Cahaya. All those you know, fights she had chances to win. The only one that was really kind of a wipeout was the was kind of the Sarah McMahon one, and obviously the Betch Cahaya fight was a super close fight. Um, you know, that was her last fight for a long time before 
Uh, the UFC gave her another chance at her natural weight class 125, and she was able to win a split decision over Kalinja Faria uh, in January of this year. Now taking on Jessica Rose Clark, who uh, did have some trouble, I believe, making weight. I want to say, um, I, I think it was a short notice fight, though. I think that was the fight against, um, I think the fight against Beck Rawlings was short notice. Um, at 125, I think she weighed in a few pounds, but got the split decision uh, over her fellow countrywoman there in Australia. Was able to come back, and it's funny because initially uh, Jessica I was actually supposed to fight uh, Paige Van Zant um, right around the same time frame, and that fight fell through for whatever reason. And then Jessica Rose Clark ends up taking on Paige Van Zant. To me, had an incredible performance in beating Paige uh, via Yam's decision also on that very same night that Jessica won earlier, uh, January 14th in St. Louis. And I kind of thought with both those girls winning, I kind of thought that this was a, a very good possibility for the next fight to have these two uh, fight each other. And that's what we're going to get, Jessica versus Jessica here in Singapore. I would say standing up, I would say uh, Jessica I has the better stamp. She's very technically sound, has very good footwork at this weight class, uh, I think has a little more power, uh, is a little stronger, and I think is also even faster at this weight class. She was always fast at bantamweight, but I think the putting everything together, she's obviously uh, entered a lot of grappling tournaments, so I think she's really improved in her jiu-jitsu game, which is something that's always kind of been a little bit of a weakness for her, uh, especially when you look at some of those fights against like Pena, McMahon, and Misha Tate, and so I think she's improved in that, especially if you look at that fight against Farah, she was going for um, some heel hooks and leg entanglement battles and stuff, so you can definitely see that she has improved on the ground. Now, I will say Jessica Rose Clark is probably going to be a little bigger, but with Jessica fighting so many years in the bantamweight division i don't think that should really phase her so much uh i would say overall as for wrestling jessica rose clark is probably the better wrestler uh, conditioning probably say jessica i and to me really is whether or not uh, much like our last fight the range is going to be a really big deal because i feel like jessica is very good at range uh if you give her space she can work really well she likes pumping the jab setting up combinations leg kicks she's very good at that in and out circling she's very good at that i think jessica rose clark to win this fight has to be up close to jessica i i don't think she can really win a fight at range um, you know, Jessica's a little different than Paige Van Zandt. I think Paige Van Zandt likes to come forward a lot more with the kicks, likes to kind of go into those situations where I think Jessica is almost the opposite. She'll, she'll be looking to exit from a lot of those combinations. And even though she's not afraid now of grappling exchanges and she could fare much better, I don't think getting into a grappling battle with Jessica Rose Clark would be the best idea for Jessica, just because I think Jessica Rose Clark has a very good uh, top game. If she gets on top, I think it would be hard for Jessica I to pull off even her improved jiu-jitsu skills. I wouldn't advise that. So I think if Jessica Rose Clark can get on the inside, uh, you know, and really try to frustrate um, I that way, then she can get a victory. But if she just kind of stays at range, that comfortable, uh, you know, just outside of the, the pocket range, then Jessica I can win that fight against anybody. That that's for sure, especially at 125. All right, next fight of the evening, that's going to be the co-main event. Ovin St. Pru against Tyson Pedro. Woo! This one, uh, don't blink, ladies and gentlemen. These two dudes, they're big, they're strong, they hit really hard. They also have very good chokes if you get up uh, close to them. Uh, and super excited for this one. I mean, Ovin St. Pru, obviously his last fight didn't quite go his way you know he had uh some good exchanges but ended up then getting uh dropped and then caught going out cold in the submission uh by the swede alir latifi that ended a run by osp of three consecutive victories all of them by finish over the likes of marcos uh, rodrigo de lima yushin okami and Corey anderson uh looks like osp was kind of priming himself for another run at the top but got stopped by latifi so you gotta believe that he wants to kind of get back uh you know, into the picture there at 205 pounds. And really for Tyson Pedro, he's really looking to kind of break out. He's looking for that breakout performance. You know, he had two very nice wins uh, in his first two UFC fights, uh, submitting Khalil Roundtree and then knocking out the Bear Jew, Paul Craig. Then he ran into that same guy, that Alir Latifi, which I knew was going to be a, a tough fight for him. First time he had really taken on a very strong grappler, um, you know, and just simply fought a better grappler there. Then he took on... Um, 
Sapabaric Sarov uh, in his next fight. Again, a guy that probably should be at middleweight uh, to kind of get him a bounce back victory, submitting him in the last round in February of this year. And I think the difference will be, I, might be the potential takedowns of Ovin St. Peru. Obviously, he gets on top and gets side control. I mean, he's hit three Von Flu chokes. He could do that to anybody. Um, you know, very athletic. Uh, you know, has a crazy reach, if, I'm, if I do this correctly. I mean, 80-inch reach, but Pedro, actually, believe it or not, has 79-inch reach. Normally, that's a huge factor. Um, but for, for OSP, not as big a factor as it usually is. Um, I really think both guys are, are very evenly matched. I give a, maybe a slight edge in grappling to Ovin's St. Peru. Um, power, man, that's really hard to, that's really hard to gauge. They're both pretty powerful dudes. Uh, man, I, I think that's, that's a tough one to say who has more power. Um, obviously, Ovin St. Prue has more experience. He's fought for an interim UFC championship. Um, he's been in several main events over the years, so he's no stranger to kind of the spotlight. Um, and so will that get Tyson Pedro? Obviously, the last time he take it, he had taken on uh, a guy in the top 10 in the light heavyweight division did not fare very well against Earlier Latifi. How will he fare this time? You know, this is Tyson Pedro's chance to, to break out and really assert himself as one of the young up-and-coming guys in this division and a guaranteed top 10 fighter. And OSP's a guy you got to beat if you want to get to the top. So, uh, and for OSP, obviously, he's looking to make it you know, four out of his five last fight's victories. That still puts him, you know, in a good position in the division that's light. He's a guy that, you know, even though he had that shot at Jones Jones uh, for the interim title, hasn't had a taste at the actual gold yet. And with the division in flux with Daniel Cormier moving back up to heavyweight to fight for the heavyweight championship, um, you know, and who knows how much longer he'll fight. And we're in the uncertainty of John Jones, you know, being someone like Tyson Pedro can put OSP in a very good position uh, to try to get back uh, to a championship contender fight. So very intrigued by this one. I think this one definitely has fight of the night, knockout of the night uh, potential in the co-main event. Getting to the main event of the evening, it's going to be in the welterweight division as Donald Cerrone takes on Leon Edwards. Now, both these guys are very good strikers. Both are very technically sound. Um, I would say the biggest difference is going to be the jiu-jitsu of Donald Cerrone. Now, I wouldn't say Cerrone is particularly a great wrestler. Most of his jiu-jitsu is defensively with guys taking him down after he overwhelms them with strikes. But over the years, I think he has slowly developed a pretty good offensive wrestling game, and I think that's where he has to use this uh, fight. Now, it's not to say that Donald Cerrone can't stand and he can't trade with Leon Edwards. That's not what I'm saying, and I'm sure that's probably actually how he's going to open up the fight. But Leon Edwards, while improving in his takedown defense, I still don't think um, can match Cerrone on the ground with jiu-jitsu skills. And so even if Cerrone doesn't want to use an uh, takedown-heavy offense, that's, of course, something in scrambles. You know, uh, if he catches a leg kick or anything like that, you got to be wary of because Cerrone, uh, I don't, not, I'm not sure if he is a black belt, but I mean, he's very skilled on the ground, has a lot of submission victories. Uh, the majority of the wins in his career, almost half his wins, he's 33 and 10, about half his wins are by submission. I think that's like 16 wins by submission or something like that. So very skilled on the ground. Uh, I mean, he almost has as many submission victories as Leon Edwards has fights, 14 and 3. So that that's really where I'm looking at, as an X factor is whether or not this thing goes to the ground at all or whether or not in a scramble Cerrone, you know, somehow gets the back or not. Because I, I think standing up, they're both very technically sound. Um, one thing also you got to look out for is Leon Edwards has never been in a main event before. Don Cerrone has main evented several cards throughout the years at two different weight classes at 170. Obviously, he's a guy that's very fresh. Um, with his conditioning. He's always been a well-conditioned athlete. I don't think there's any reason to believe that he couldn't go 25 minutes. Uh, he's done it so many times in the past for Edwards. Definitely unknown if this thing gets into the fourth and fifth rounds. We're not really sure how he's going to react, how he's going to pace himself. Is he going to fight any differently knowing that he could potentially fight 10 more, diff 10 more minutes? So I think that's a lot, uh, a lot of things to look at on the side of Leon Edwards. And of course, Don Cerrone, 
He's the higher ranked guy. He's ranked 11. Uh, Leon Edwards is ranked 13. This is really the first time Leon Edwards has had a big chance to showcase his skills. And we all know Don Cerrone's kind of been up and down lately um, in his career after a kind of great start to his uh, run in the welterweight division, um, which started in 2016, defeating the likes of Alex Oliveira, Patrick Cote, Rick Story, and Matt Brown, finishing all four of those fights. Uh, ran into some of the, the top guys in this division, getting knocked out by Jorge Masvidal, uh, getting beat by Robbie Lawler, even though that was a close fight, he still got beat, and then got knocked out uh, by Darren Till uh, in October of last year. Rebounded in a crazy one-round war with Yancey Medeiros, knocking out Yancey uh, in Austin, Texas earlier this year. So back on the winning track is Cowboy. And, you know, are we going to see the Cowboy that wants to do a firefight against Yancey? Or, you know, are we going to see the Cowboy that, you know, gets dropped early like he did against Darren Till? Very possible, very intriguing, and uh, I really think this, you know, the undercard, like I said, has a lot of names people might not recognize, but this four-fight main card uh, for the Singapore card on Fight Pass is absolutely excellent. So I'm going to hold my picks here at the very end because um, I'm going to discuss a few things real quick before I end the program. That's, of course, the uh, EBI 16, that's going to be happening this Sunday on UFC Fight Pass. EBI, of course, is the Eddie Bravo Invitational, the Nogi submission-only uh, tournament, uh, which will, again, feature the female bantamweight divisions. Might have some notable names that fans have heard of before. Uh, Brooke Mayo, she has competed in Bellator and also formerly competed uh, in an EBI, EBI combat jiu-jitsu. She's actually going to be competing in this one. Um, she's been training with, uh, with Half Gracie as well as Team Alpha Male. Um, she's now been doing a lot of training with uh, Nick Diaz's academy. Um, she's also done some professional Muay Thai and kickboxing. Um, you know, she was five and one as an amateur. I believe she's one and two as a pro MMA fighter, maybe one and one. Um, and like I said, she previously did make the finals of the EBI. Uh, flyweight female combat jiu-jitsu tournament only losing to Alima Leigh McFarlane in what was a close fight so no shame um, in that there so she's going to be one of the more uh, notable names there uh, for the uh, EBI tournament um, also going to look at um, Ray, uh, Raquel Pahalui Kanato obviously she's uh, Used to fight MMA, uh, used to be fighting for Invicta, but kind of recently has just been doing uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, doing a lot more tournaments, uh, training with that Checkmat team. Um, she's also been doing IBJJF tournaments as well, so she's looking to uh, obviously add an EBI uh, championship to her resume, but uh, a name that fans uh, may remember from the world of mixed martial arts. Um, so those are some of the, the top uh, standouts there for EBI 16. Of course, as I also mentioned, uh, Richie the Boogeyman Martinez will be making a combat jiu-jitsu uh, match defending his combat jiu-jitsu title at EBI. He was originally supposed to take on Wagner Hosha, uh, but a new matchup is taking place. At, um, a new f opponent is going to be taking place. So still a very good card and very uh, much looking forward to EBI. If you've never watched EBI before, and really if you've never watched a professional jiu-jitsu uh, tournament before men or women. Uh, I really like the EBI format. Um, most jujitsu competitions, near gi or no gi, are going to use some uh, point-based system to determine a winner. Sometimes judges are involved. Obviously, submissions are always always can happen. But in EBI, it's submission only. So that means there's no points awarded. Um, it's just simply one 10 minute match. You get a chance to uh, submit your opponent. If it doesn't, it goes to an overtime round. For the first couple rounds, I think they just do one round. You start in a, a certain position of your choice that's either the back mount or what they call the spider web position, which is kind of like a modified uh, setup for an arm bar. So you start one of those rounds, it's timed. If you don't get a submission, then whoever held the, the offensive position the longest uh, gets the win. So there's no judges, there's just simply a referee to make sure nothing crazy or illegal. Uh, happens there and it just goes uh, starts with 16 obviously we get down to one and um, I think you only get money if you get finishes so if you end up winning the whole tournament and don't finish anybody you actually don't get um, 
I think you don't actually get any money or a very small amount of money. But if you get a submission, you get a certain amount of total. So that's another incentive other than it being submission only um, is for uh, these girls and, and guys when, it is, uh, when they do uh, men's tournaments as well to get finishes because it's going to equal money. So I, I've, I've watched every single EBI on Fight Pass, um, and they're absolutely fantastic. Um, I really like it. Uh, and if you've never seen a jiu-jitsu term before and you're really just coming from watching mixed martial arts, I, I think this is, uh, and obviously the combat jiu-jitsu is kind of in between the two, so I think that's a great, this is definitely a good card to kind of dip your toe in uh, the jiu-jitsu table if you've never really seen any high-level, just uh, pure jiu-jitsu matches. Also, uh, as I mentioned, Professional Fighters League, uh, they held their second event this past uh, week from Chicago. Obviously, um, I, I really enjoyed Professional Fighter League 1, but Professional Fighter League 2, while a lot of good fights, a lot of good, a lot of known fighters uh, on the card, a lot of great finishes. I mean, we had Brian Foster, um, Sean O'Connell, Brandon Halsey, man, his fight against uh, Shamil Rama, my goodness, what a fight. Um, Vinny Malga, yes. Uh, we also had Tiago Tavares, Jason Busher, Chris Wade, you know, Dan Spawn, a whole bunch of guys, you know, Hani Marks, Jason High, you know, Ramsey Nijam, uh, Will Brooks, he was in the main event. He, he won in the main event against Luis Firmino, uh, another notable guy. So, I mean, a lot of notable names on this card, but um, a couple things that kind of bothered me um, on this card. The first thing that bothered me was in the Robert Watley Tiago Tavares fight. Now, officially, if you read this, this ended by knockout via accidental groin strike in round number two. Now, Tiago Tavares took a shot to the groin. He couldn't continue after the five minutes of recovery period. And then, so they stopped the fight because obviously he couldn't continue. Now, of course, they're doing this points format for professional fighters league. So they have 12 fighters in each uh, weight class. Each of them get two, I guess, regular season or preliminary bouts, however you want to say that. And then the eight fighters with the most points move on to the postseason or playoffs, okay? So if you get a you get three points for a victory no matter how that happens. And then you get bonus points if you get a three bonus points if you finish in the first round, two bonus points if you finish in the second round, and one bonus point if you finish in the fourth round. So, and obviously I think you do get one point if it ends up being a draw. So with this happening 35 seconds in, to the second round, uh, referee, I believe it's Keith Peterson, a guy who's refereed many big time fights, has refereed in the UFC as well. I think he's a good ref. I don't think this, it wasn't his decision to stop it, but I think this was the commission's decision, the judges, referees, everybody involved, to call it a knockout victory for Robert uh, Watley. And they were saying because he had won the first round and the round couldn't go more, that he gets the victory. Now, normally, maybe that wouldn't be such a big deal, but since they're doing this points things, that means that Robert Rotley gets five points and Tiago Tavares obviously gets none. To me, this is a no contest. Or at the very least should be scored a draw because one round happened. Yeah, Tavares lost that round, but one round wasn't even halfway through the fight. I thought there was a certain point in a fight that they have to make it to that if a foul happens, they can judge that fight. I believe that I remember this happening in the Donald Cerrone Jamie Varner fight going back years ago when they fought each other for the WEC lightweight championship. And I think he had gotten past a certain point in the fourth round where Jamie Varner couldn't continue after a legal knee, so they judged the fight up until that point. But if it had happened earlier and Varner couldn't continue, I believe it would have ended as a no contest. Now, because of the points, a no contest wouldn't do anything. Now they could draw call this fight a draw, each get them the, their one point. But uh, to give, I don't, I, I think this was a, a very bad mistake by the commission to give this, you know, wins one thing, but now with the way they're doing the points, you know, you could really, if this was just a regular league, even the UFC, you could kind of like, well, he didn't really lose. It was a bad commission. Everyone would know that. But with these points thing, now all of a sudden Tiago Tavares is going to be way behind the eight ball because he should have at least gotten one point or Rob Rotley for sure shouldn't have gotten five. Uh, and I think that, that that's very unfortunate because he got hit hard and he just couldn't continue, man. He just, it, it just, it got all bullets in his stomach and he couldn't do anything. So I, I didn't like that. Again, this was not professional fighter league's fault, but again, it, it, it looks bad because if it wasn't for their, their system, which I do like, you know, th this is the, the potential problem with a system like this. So, 
Uh, so that happened there. Then there was, let's see. Um, now there also now there was a little bit of an injury in the Jason Busher fight um, against Max Griffins. Griffins. That one I didn't mind as much because he was in bad trouble. He kind of rolled over his leg. I mean, he was in a bad spot. I don't, I don't, you know, the butcher wouldn't have got out of that. And then, of course, in between rounds, Raheem Hebelin just, you know, hit him too much. Uh, Rashid Yusupov. There was even a chance where Yusupov even tried to call timeout, uh, which could have been because of the jaw, so they stopped it in there. Again, you know, not really too worried about that. But then, uh, then they're calling a, let's see. Now, in the Halsey fight, they're s claiming a, a stoppage due to... Oh, okay, that's right. That was due to the cut. Okay, that one I didn't have a problem with. Uh, Brandon Halsey coming back and defeating Rama. I mean, he definitely had, you know, a lot of damage there. Uh, a lot of blood. Um, boy, what was the other fight? Yeah, the illegal blow was the one that I, you know, really had an, an issue with. Uh, the accidental groin straight on Tavares. That, that's something that definitely has to be... Um, you know, changed, I, I think, moving forward. Um, oh, the... Boy, okay, this this one was even worse. The Efren Escudero against Jason High fight. Uh, a fight which Jason High, in my opinion, probably had won the first two rounds. Then in the third round, goes for a takedown. Efren Escudero tries for a guillotine choke. Um, you see on the one side, that the side that the, the main camera is on, he goes to reach with his right hand to try to pull down the hand of the guillotine choke while also posturing up. To, 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 the, to tuck the neck and obviously try to pop his head out. Well, and then all of a sudden we see the referee stop it. Now, when they show the reverse angle, you see him with his left hand on the other side try to come in and fight the hands. You see it looks like a tapping motion, but there's just one brief kind of touch, and then you see him bring his left hand out. The referee took that as a tap and stopped the fight. Now... In the referee's defense, yeah, you kind of saw it, but to me, that's not a real tap. Because if a guy truly was tapping in the fight and he tapped and nothing happened, he wouldn't go on and continue to fight. He probably would continue tapping. That's what you do when you're tapping out, uh, is you continue to tap. And I always look at three taps is an actual tap. You got to give one as is accidental. You know, maybe he's trying to move in position. Okay, two, maybe, but three. If someone taps three times in a row in the same spot, that's a tap. That's how I always look at it. If you want to look at official technicality. Um, and obviously, he wasn't close to going out because he was posturing up. If he was out, unconscious, he would be flat on top of Efren Escudero. And if, even if the referee was unsure, he could have said a verbal warming, like, are you okay? Are you in there? Otherwise, I'm going to have to stop this. Nothing was made, and the referee stops it. And again, because of this point thing, uh, Efren, well, Efren, Efren and Escudero actually missed weight. So they said Efren and Escudero can't get actually any points for this win. I guess that's what's the most unfortunate thing is now, um, you know, Jason High was deprived of trying to at least get three points for himself if he wouldn't have ended up, you know, uh, getting a decision victory. So he deprived of three points and obviously a rush on the record. And again, he actually push the referee again <laughs> but this time he had a little more thing and you hear him yelling pound at the man i did not tap and this was bad because this was a bad judgment call because on a choke there's going to be no long-term damage to the fighter even if they go out nothing's going to change it's not like taking punches to the head and you can go well he maybe let that early you know it wasn't an arm bar where you're worried about the uh, the guy's arm getting broken okay again it's a choke much like the maru yamasaki thing you know, it's a choke. There's no going to be long-term damage to the fighter if they end up going out. And these guys train too hard and too long for a judgment call to take away, uh, you know, point take away wins from them. And especially in this professional fighter league, these wins mean more than ever because if they don't get enough points, they don't get to the playoffs and they don't get a chance for that huge payday of a million dollars. And while, yeah, that was a bad call by the commission in the, you know, fight earlier with Tiago Tavares, you know, and you can kind of, 
and while Robert, that again, that wasn't a mistake by Robert Wally, but this one by the referee, I think is even worse than that one, because that one, I at least can kind of see their logic. I can see the logic of he had won the first round, it stopped short in the second, so he was ahead on points, and so he gets a victory. At least I can see the logic there. I don't like it, I don't agree with it, but at least I can see the logic, and I can be at peace and see that they came to me at least a sound decision. And this one, there is no logic to it. It's simply he messed up, uh, the referee in that matchup, and messed up bad. Um, because, again, it's on a submission that there's no long-term damage. So the worst thing that happens is Jason Hyatt goes out, you lift up his legs, he comes back, you know, the, 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 the wind and air comes back into him because it's a blood choke. And, yeah, so th this, this was bad. And you see Escudero celebrating like he had won. I think Escudero knew he didn't tap. I, I don't know if that was him trying to sell it for the crowd. You can see the crowd booing. But if you're a referee, again, you always got to make sure that you're, you're making the right decision. If you're, not, if you're unsure, let the fight continue. And again, on a submission like this, you got to let uh, Jason High continue because, like I said, you would have known if he was out, if he was tapping, he would have continued to tap. Uh, and that's another sign, too. Uh, I just think that this was a bad decision by the referee and it's very unfortunate for Jason High um, to have this happen to him but other than those two kind of little minor issues again nothing that was wrong nothing at fault of professional like the other that some re like really great fights I mean the Sean O'Connell Honey Marks fight was incredible so was Brian Foster Ranzi Nijam with that finish um, you know the Vinny Magalesh had a very good very good decision and up until the stoppage Rakeem Cleveland fought well I mean um, boy uh, Natan Schalte put on a heck of a performance against Chris Wade. You know, Dan Spawn coming back to get that knockout over ITF. Um, a lot of these fights are still available on Facebook if you haven't already seen them. Uh, and, the, of course, the, the halsey Shamil Rama fight, absolutely insane. So, other than those two little gaffes, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, Professional Fighter Leagues 2. And uh, their next event actually will be coming up July 5th. That's a Thursday from Washington, D.C. on NBC Sports. And, of course, the undercard on facebook so uh super excited for that and um so uh let's see i got i got anything else to touch uh oh the contender series okay so two episodes of the contender series uh have happened um so far for fight pass now i've let, i've enjoyed the contender series obviously since its uh inception uh last year and the contender series has been good so far this year. Of course, a lot of people, you know, weren't sure about uh, signing, uh, you know, Greg Hardy, which I get it. He, he's had a kind of a checkered past, but obviously, he's a big name um, coming from the world of professional football in the NFL in America. Obviously, I mean, he knocked out the dude in you know thirty seconds or whatever. He's obviously going to have to get some work in, but definitely a dude that um, I think has a lot of potential. He obviously has a lot of outside stuff that that's preventing this and obviously that's something that the UFC is taking a risk on um as far as PR and but uh, at the same token it's not the first time that either a former fighter uh a new signee a guy currently on the roster has had such allegations against them uh whether they were actually proven or unproven uh, there's been several fighters uh, over the years that have had some of these allegations in fact Travis Brown had a lot of these allegations so did Anthony Johnson um and I believe Tiago Silva also may have had some uh, issues with this as well. Uh, and obviously, of course, he was long gone from the UFC, but um, John Hakopenhaver, a.k.a. War Machine, obviously had maybe the most famous case of this. So uh, while I'm not belittling what Greg Hardy may or may not have done um, to somebody, it is something that, I'm not sure how much the UFC has really looked into and investigated. Again, they're not the job of policing things. And as, as far as a court of law goes, he's never been convicted, uh, arrested, or put in jail for anything, as far as I know. Now, if someone wants to send me some information that contradicts that, that says, yes, he has had this happen, then, hey, I'm willing to change. I'm just saying from what I know uh, on the surface. Now, again, I'm not defending any of his actions, and I think it's something the UFC should look into and should have probably looked into further before saying for sure that they were going to sign him on the Contender Series. Um, now, by sign him, I mean sign him after the fight. I think it was okay to have him on for one fight to see if the guy could even fight. 
um, then you can kind of make that decision kind of weighing in, you know, who is Greg Hardy as a person. Um, I haven't heard a lot of comments from Greg Hardy saying, you know, anything really about this. I'm sure if you look hard enough, you can find him. But it's definitely something I think the UFC has to keep an eye on. Um, because while, yes, it looks like he's an extremely talented individual, you also got to look at that, you know, the other stuff too. And, that, and that's something that, uh, you know, you're not just signing a guy because of his talent. You're signing, you know, the whole, the whole person. And so I think that's something they could look as well. But, um... Is really the big highlight of last week's show. Really good. Obviously, this week, this week, five finishes. Uh, four of the fighters getting signed. The only one not getting signed was Austin Springer, who I'm going to be honest. I've seen uh, Giga Chikazi fight many times in the Glory Kickboxing ring. He's one of the best kickboxers in the world in the featherweight division. Has had a couple of MMA fights, but obviously gets a chance here to trying to transition full time to doing MMA. You know, obviously his stand up, the Giga kick. You know, that left kick uh, to the liver. Um, he definitely had a lot of stamp shows. He showed some grasping and fundamental concepts of jiu-jitsu. I wouldn't say he's completely there yet, but definitely saw a guy that is familiar with these positions. He may, he's obviously not a master, not a particularly great, but at least he knows his way around a grappling thing, which is more than I thought he did. So from that point, I was good. But Austin Springer, you got to give a lot of credit. I mean, he took a lot of nasty kicks, a lot of kicks that would have dropped a lot of people in either mixed martial arts or professional kickboxing. Uh, you know, he was able to get the fight, obviously trying to get to the ground as much as he can. Got in a good position, um, a position that obviously, again, Giga is still trying to get uh, familiar with and got the submission. And even though he didn't get the contract, you got to give the kid a lot of credit because he definitely was not the favorite. People were not predicting him to win. People were not even predicting him to, to last to the third round against Giga. So you got to give this kid a lot of credit. And, um, you know, it may have not been the most technically sound he was losing, but he, but he showed a lot of heart, determination, um, and he didn't break. He kept going, and, and he got that finish. So you got to give him a lot of credit, but the other guys, it's kind of hard to, to deny. I mean, Dwight Grant looked really good, you know, that overhand right, uh, knocking out Tyler Hill in the second round, um, just as Hill was kind of coming on to start that round. Then, of course, Ryan Spawn, I mean, that quick guillotine choke. Anthony Hernandez, my goodness, um, knocking out Jordan Wright. And then Matt Salas uh, in the main event there, um, you know, knocking him out silly. Uh, so I, I can't really deny them signing four guys. I mean, they were all very impressive. And that's what you aim to do on the Contender Series. So uh, very good. Uh, I mean, both episodes were good, but this episode, maybe, maybe arguably the best episode ever of the Dana White Contender Series. So if you haven't watched either episode yet, of course, they're on UFC Fight Pass. Which leads me to this weekend's action on UFC Fight Pass for UFC Singapore. Going to pick the main card for these fights. Starting in the welterweight division. Again, overall four fights on the main card. Lee Jianlang against DG Abe uh, in the welterweight division. I'm going to go uh, Liang in this one. Um, I think that his wrestling, his overall grappling skills uh, are going to be too much for Abe to deal with. So I'm going to go with the leech in this one. Jessica I, a.k.a. Jesse Jess, against Jessica Evil I in the female flyweight division. This one's very tough for me to pick. I'm a fan of both these ladies. I think they're both extremely talented and definitely two of the best flyweight fighters in the female division of the UFC. But I'm going to go with Jessica I in this one. I, I think her stand-up skills, her ability to really strike well at range, and I think her improved grappling skills and the fact she's dealt with a lot of bigger girls before fighting in bantamweight, uh, I give her a slight edge. Uh, I'm going to pick her to win over Jessica Rose Clark. Co-main event of the evening, Ovin St. Peru against Tyson Pedro. <sighs> I really think this is a close fight. Uh, I think it's very evenly matched. Both guys are heavy hitters. But I'm going to go Ovin St. Peru uh, with his experience. I think he's a little better offensively with his grappling game. So I'm going to go uh, with the former Tennessee Volunteer to win this one. And in the main event, Don Cerrone against Leon Edwards. I've been a fan of Leon Edwards for a very long time. I really like Leon Edwards. But... The, the scramble situations, obviously the jiu-jitsu situations, and the fact he's never been 25 minutes before, all kind of some question marks to me. Maybe Leon Edwards can pass them with flying covers, but I'm going to go with the veteran Donald Cerrone in this one. So that's, that's this week's Live Beyond the Cage here at MMA World. Uh, thanks again for watching. I uh, hope you liked it and shared it. And, of course, like the page here, facebook.com slash MMA World with two extra Ds. Also, check out our sister page and our uh, – 
site that we're based on, MMAUK.net, for the latest and greatest uh, breaking news, opinions, results, and everything else that's going on uh, within the world of mixed martial arts, uh, again with a focus on the United Kingdom. That's Facebook.com slash Mixed Martial Arts UK, and on Twitter and Instagram at WeAreMMAUK. I'm your host, Jim Graham. You can follow me on Twitter at Jim Graham. Until next week, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond the Cage. Goodbye, everybody.